Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. I work with technical professionals so they can present more effectively, especially in front of non-technical audiences. And you can learn more about that at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. If you are watching this episode, remember to leave a comment and subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening, a review would always be appreciated. Today, my guest is Dr. Christian Greer. A former guest, Julie C. Henry, introduced me to Dr. Greer. When I saw his background, I thought he'd be interesting to talk to. With a background in physics, he got his doctorate in education, too. So what does that lead to? Running a science center, of course. <laughs> so I'm really interested to learn more about his journey to the science center and science communication generally. So welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Dr. Greer. It's good to be here, Neil. I like your program, your format, and uh, and the cause to get people with technical backgrounds to be able to communicate better. Thank you. So from the bit of research I did on you, and I mentioned in the intro that you studied physics. So where did the interest in physics come from? Well, you know, it started at a young age. I was always interested in astronomy and space primarily. And then I ended up uh, uh, deciding that physics might be a good channel in that in that direction. Uh, I used to hang out as a kid at the museums in my hometown of Chicago. And back then, all the museums were free, uh, the ones that were on Park District land. And my uh, parents got a a membership to one of the museums. We, I think we have memberships to several, but the one that I remember the most was the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. It's a big domed building on sort of on a peninsula in Solidarity Drive, uh, just sort of south of the downtown area and uh, right on the lake. And I just thought it was picturesque. I thought uh, looking through the telescopes, the observatory was cool. And you get a lot of behind the scenes tours. So got hooked on, on science in that way and then ended up going to Morehouse College for Physics. Nice. But then you didn't stop there. I mentioned you got a doctorate in education. So what was the, the motivation to get that degree? Well, I, after physics, I had no intention of going back to school. It was hard. <laughs> so I didn't think I would ever go to graduate school. But what ended up happening is I was at a technical conference um, called ISTE. I don't know what it's called now. Or maybe it was called NEC at the time. But it was like the uh, International Society of technology educators or something like that. And uh, while I was there, uh, there was a, a table for a university program at Pepperdine University. And at Pepperdine, they were doing an online uh, program to teach people how to, you know, use um, technology to be able to educate people. And, you know, in my mind, I think of education as really expanding someone's learning potential and think about the impacts of using technology to be able to do that. It's great. So I, I fi figured that was the future, wanted to be involved in it. And uh, ended up going back to graduate school and then later got a doctorate in learning technologies as well. My interest was in uh, distributed leadership and communication through online learning circles. So uh, having learning environments where people connect uh, as groups of people in agile ways um, through technology. So how did you decide to get involved in science communication in the first place? Well, it was kind of uh, accidental in a sense because... Um, you know, for me, when I was working at the planetarium, I uh, didn't have an internship. I was interested in going to aerospace engineering at the time. And um, I had taken some sort of pre-engineering programs at uh, Georgia Tech when I was at Morehouse in Atlanta and wasn't sure what I was going to do for the summer. I'd apply for different internships, didn't get anything. So my mom was the one that recommended, hey, you used to hang out at the planetarium. What if you went to the planetarium to... <laughs> to, uh, you know, see if they have any jobs. And I was thinking, well, you know, I'm not so much interested in astronomy now, I'm more interested in aerospace engineering. Um, but I ended up giving them a call. They asked me to come in and interview. I interviewed and got the job. The job was an intern's assistant. So they, every year for 20 years or so, they had an, uh, an intern that would, they were trained to go into the field of planetariums um, and in science. And, uh, I guess they had created a new position called an intern's assistant for astronomy assistant over the summer. And that's what I was. So I did all the dirty work for the intern and all the tough things that nobody wanted to do for the astronomers as a gopher for the astronomers. But one thing that was interesting, it was the summer of 1991. And so for astronomy space ge geeks would know that that was a, the great eclipse of 1991. Uh, during that time, while I was still in college, uh, you know, they asked me to go and help out one of the interns to be able to facilitate conversations in front of groups of people for the eclipse. So they had a projection screen 
uh, of the eclipse and he was narrating what was going on. So we were in the planet hall, which had about 450 people in there. So it was a very popular day for the planetarium because everybody wanted to know about the eclipse. Well, I'm standing there just kind of helping him out. And he's talking for hours. The eclipse is kind of like a Super Bowl, you know, where you have all this lead up to it before the, you know, two minutes or whatever of a, of a time you get to actually see the eclipse of totality. And uh, so as he was talking, you know, his throat got a little parched. And I remember he asked me to go get him some water. So I went as a gopher to get some water, brought it to him. He starts drinking. He's still talking about the sun and the solar corona and the prominence on the surface and, and uh, you know, all kinds of things about fusion. And uh, as, he, as he was talking about this, um, drinking all the water made him have to go to use the restroom. So right before leading up to the eclipse, <laughs> uh, he uh, said, hey, you know, I I'm going to be right back with you guys, but I'm going to have my assistant Christian take over. And uh, this is so everyone's looking at him. And then all of a sudden they look at me and he puts the microphone in my chest. And, you know, and I hear you hear it thump, you know, on the uh, over the PA. And he's and I said, well, I, I'm not really prepared for this. He said, that's OK. Just tell them what you know. Tell them what you know. So I got up there. I started talking about what I knew. Well, you know, uh, this eclipse happens because uh, the uh, although the sun is 400 times further away, um, the moon is 400 times. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, you know, in terms of the, the view. And so you can actually see where the moon, um, uh, the, the, the moon covers the sun. And uh, at certain times when you have those um, orbits line up um, on the serial cycle, you can have the eclipse. So we talked a little bit about that. Uh, and I talked about the solar corona and the prominences and sunspots and all that sort of thing. And so as I'm going, I turn around and I see him come up, coming from the restroom, and I get ready to hand the microphone back to Terry. And Terry says to me, hey, you know what? You're doing fine all by yourself. Just keep going. And so I ended up narrating the entire eclipse. Uh, I was a shy kid, never really been on a microphone before. But what he told me to basically tell them what you know, kind of relaxed me because I focused on the things that I knew best and I just shared those things. And that's what really helped for me. Nice. You know, when you were talking, Dr. Greer, it reminded me of a former guest. Uh, Doc, uh, his name is Mike Chinelli. He works at NASA and he's been there for a number of years. But her, to get into NASA was actually quite the ordeal. He had applied, but he didn't actually get in until five years after applying. So for five years, he had... He found odd jobs to do, just waiting to get that opportunity to get into NASA. So maybe the fact that you didn't go down the aerospace engineering path, maybe, maybe that was a, a blessing in disguise. Did you have five years to spare? <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, you don't really realize where your path is going to go. But I can tell you that public speaking and communication is a factor in where you get to go. Um, how you communicate who you are, what you can do. Um, also what your interests are. And then people want to be able to know that you have a personality that is relatable. Uh, you know, so much of what we do in technical fields now is collaborative. That is the future. There's no way that it's going to go away from that. Now, you may be doing things on your own, in your own, you know, using AI or designing something or whatever you're doing, but eventually it's got to plug into something. It's got to plug into someone else. And a lot of times we're taking on projects that are going down roads we've never been before. And so uh, being able to have that communication is very important. I think it's also important for leadership. You know, a lot of times we think about leadership and formal connections and formal structures within organizations, but it's the informal structures for projects and things that are that are very valuable, especially when it comes to, in, uh, to uh, innovation. And so being able to talk across groups and speak the language of marketers and salespeople, as well as engineers and, and scientists, all of that stuff comes into play. And, and I think that those that are more comfortable speaking, more comfortable with communicating and listening, which is also critically important, the audience that you're communicating with um, will get you where you want to be. How does you having a PhD inform the work that you do currently? That's interesting. I have an EDD, a, a doctorate in education yeah, uh, from EDD. Pepperdine University. And, uh, um, and what's interesting about that is, I think the process of creating new knowledge, which is essentially what you do when you create a dissertation, you're trying to go out, you know, it's like this big tree uh, in your subject area and there's different branches. And then, you know, there's kind of like parts that come off the branch. And then there's that one little leaf, as they tell you, is, is what you're studying and trying to build out. 
that's creating new knowledge. I think the process of creating new knowledge means that you have to understand what the existing knowledge is and where the edges are. And so for me, I think trying to be on the edge from an innovation standpoint, being on the edge from reimagining things, being on the edge from, well, this is kind of risky, is really important. And you do that when you're creating new knowledge. So it trained me to think a little bit more broadly on what is it that we're actually doing in our work and to what extent can we push the boundaries? Test pilots always talk about the being on the edge or outside of that envelope was where the danger is. You know, you test an aircraft, it can only go so high under certain conditions. It can only go so fast before the wings fall off. It can only go, you know, and, uh, you know, turn and, and be agile under certain conditions. And so those test pilots are trying to figure out what the boundaries are of that particular aircraft. And it's dangerous getting out there. But as they learn that, they figure out how to uh, determine what the max performance is. And I think in our world as leaders, what is the maximum performance that your team can do without breaking down? And you want to stay on that edge if you're going to be innovative. It is tricky. It can be dangerous. You can make mistakes. Um, But you learn from your mistakes. Hopefully don't repeat a lot of things in the past. Stay away from the real challenges and go out there and make a difference. And you need to inspire your team to be able to do that. So for me, getting the doctorate was a way of me learning how to go on my edge and determine where I could be. So as I'm coaching and leading others in that way, whether it's communication or just doing other aspects of their job, I feel like I can keep them close to the edge so they feel like the little excitement, the adrenaline is flowing, but not so much that anybody gets hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you certainly don't want anyone to get hurt because they'll take you in front of Judge Judy. Yeah, we don't want <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to see her. You know, no. when, when, you, when you were talking, Dr. Greer, it, when you, were, you spoke about creating new knowledge. Well, when you create new knowledge, it's replacing the old knowledge. It reminded me of my children's book. So I wrote a children's book called Ask Uncle Neil, Why Is My Hair Curly? It's about okay. my nephew asking me why his hair is the way it is. And I use science to answer the question. I sent the book to an acquaintance who has a daughter. So I thought maybe she'd, she'd enjoy the book. And when I, I called him afterwards to find out what he thought of the book, he said that he liked it, but the ending was a bit underwhelming for him because I guess, spoiler alert, there is no scientific consensus as to why my nephew's hair is the way it is. So okay. the book was basically talking about a bunch of uh, various theories as to why it is. And, it's, and then me telling him, well, maybe you could be the one who finds out the, the definitive reason as to why your hair is the way it is, that maybe you could become <laughs> a scientist to, to, to figure that out. But the the acquaintance I sent the book to didn't really like that. He wanted an answer. I, I The reason that your hair is the way it is is because of this. So when you were talking about figuring out you know, or just introduce or creating new knowledge to replace the old one, it just reminded me of people who, when they think of science, they're a bit skeptic about, skeptical about it because Things don't always aren't always, I guess, black and white. There isn't always a, a, a an answer. So, how, how do you, as a person who's, who's been in science communication for as long as you've been in it, how do you, I guess, address those type of people who are looking for answers and just this is it and this is what it's going to be? Oh wow! I mean, you—that's a sixty-four thousand dollar question because I have experienced this, the nature of what you're talking about, my entire career, which has been, like I said, since 1991. So um, when I think about um, that question, I have to say that there are sort of multiple ways in which people can approach science, technology, engineering, and math. And a lot of times people are in different lanes when they experience it. And so there's some people that are in that lane that they are just like going through. You know, other people are on the left lane. Other people are in the right lane over here trying to get on and off and then you've got carpool lanes and you got it so where you're going with people to learn and discover things um i think ultimately you have to say that science is a process and it's a process that creates products and i think in our consumer culture we're interested in the products more than we are the process I can recall watching Sesame Street and some of those old shows where they took you to a factory where they made toilet paper or you saw uh, bread being baked in a factory. I thought it was so fascinating 
you know, going from the flour and these big, you know, trucks that would pull up and do the different kinds of things to what you got a chance to eat on your plate. It takes a long time to really dive into how we learn something and know something. A lot of it is trial and error. Some of it is done on a on a uh, whiteboard, you know, in equations. And this is not accessible to a lot of people. So we're used to just not going through that part, like the lab, and just focusing on the lecture and giving everybody the details and then telling them, yeah, somebody figured this out. So I think when we get to education, the most important thing is to me, education is supposed to teach you how to learn that, you know, and the teacher is supposed to draw out the genius within that's already there. And so when we're looking for sort of the cookie cutter processed food, you know, a happy meal version of science, we're missing something. We're missing what it's really all about. So yes, I think you brought up something interesting. And, you know, in that particular case, what's interesting is about the shape of the hair makes a difference. Um, you know, we don't really realize that the shape of things kind of determine where they can and can't go. Uh, the wings have a certain shape so that lift is created. So the plane, when moving through the air, will go up. You know, there's certain kinds of shapes that you see with a comet's tail, where the pressure of the sol solar wind is, is pushing, you know, both of those tails back, the ion tail, and the dust tail back. The shape of a boat going through the water and deciding whether it needs to be you know, uh, design this way or that way. All these things have to do with just the process of understanding how things work, how the world works. And not everybody is comfortable with that. But I love the questions because the questions keep the process going. If we had everything figured out in science and it was done, which I can't imagine would be the case, I think we would learn a little bit about the natural world, but we would still be trying to discover a lot about ourselves. And that's why I think now at the edge of our knowledge, scientists are starting to be more comfortable diving into understanding what consciousness is, because that is how we perceive things. That's what separates the objective from the subjective. So I think that book makes a lot of sense because it starts with something easy, a basic question, like why is the sky blue? And guess what? People don't have time to answer those questions. They just take it for granted. <laughs> and this is the difference between someone who is on the fringes of science and someone who's on the front lines uh, into discovery. And I'm hoping that more people get more into the process and ask these questions. They lead to more questions and they learn how to be better explorers, discoverers, better scientists, technologists, engineering, engineers, and mathematicians. Yeah, I mean, when you were when you're talking, Dr. Greer, it also, it just, it reminded me again about that, that, that the, the acquaintance I sent the book to, and I just, it made me think, I wonder what type of schooling he got when he was a kid. Did right. he even get a whole lot of, of science education when he was going through school? Because when you think about it, science is all about change. I mean, the, the, the car was created... <laughs> <laughs> in what the 1800s or so by Henry Ford, but the car of Henry Ford's time is way different than the yeah. car of today. I mean, we have cars that are being driven by nobody right now. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Ford could have never right, really right, even imagined something like that. And, right, right. We went and, from the horseless carriage to the pers personless driver. I don't, I don't know. You know, like you're right. And, and that's what I think uh, technology does. And sometimes it's a variation on a theme. Like in many ways, I feel like technology is more like jazz. You know, somebody lay down a baseline and, you know, you create all these things and people kind of make a variation on it. But invention is really where where it, it happens. Those are sort of the revolutionary things that take place because now we just don't do something anymore. We don't need to because this does it for us. And that's what I think is so scary, challenging and hopeful about AI. You know, like how much do you really need to use your brain now? <laughs> we know that it's nice to not have to use our backs and making roads and, you know, using uh, construction equipment. But now what does that mean for the brain? And what is the brain going to do when certain things that we counted on it to do before are just not needed? Um, and will it atrophy just like our bodies do? And I think that's a that's a question we have to explore as we go into these new realms. Yeah, 100 percent. You know, before we started recording, you had asked me about the the genesis of what I do. And I mentioned that it was me giving presentations in front of management and not being all that great at it. But I got <laughs> a lot better at it because I saw the benefit of doing so. 
When right. it comes to giving presentations or just public speaking generally, is that something you've always been good at? And if not, what did you do to get better at it? Well, I don't think I've always been good at it. Um, I may have had some natural ability to do some things. You just never know what's on the inside of a person until you put them in that situation. But I was shy, like being in front of people and talking, I think in part because I never felt like I knew enough. Um, and especially the story that I... Um, uh, you know, shared regarding the planetarium. I'm around all these astrophysicists and I'm still a physics student. Like I was so far away. You know, we had interns that went to be NASA controllers and do all those kinds of things. I wasn't really on that track. Um, but I think uh, you have to come to grips with something uh, where there's a need. You know how they say economy is all based around the idea of scarcity, or at least that's a core component of it. I think there's some scarcity in the talents and skills that we have and what we need to be able to be successful in life. And unfortunately, very few people are like you, Neil, where they want to face that fear and get better. I had a lot of dreams when I first came into this field about new exhibits and projects and programs and things I wanted to do, but I didn't really know how to get them done. I ended up uh, getting certified as a project manager and teaching project management for seven years and was a consultant for a brief period of time, which I did on the side of my normal career. Um, got a PM, PMP and a CSM. And in teaching project management, the people asked me like, why were you really interested in it? I was like, project management itself is kind of boring. It's not, it's not really all that exciting, but when you think about it as the tool to be able to, like a hammer is not exciting, but look at all the things you can do with it. So I think there's kind of one of those things where um, I think it's important, Neil, for people to be able to hone a skill and find out what they can do. And there's so many people that don't feel like they could get up on stage and speak. But if you think about what you know, and you think about what others don't know, and what they want to hear from you, it's almost as natural as talking to someone in a coffee shop. You're just talking to 400 people, you're connecting with them on those same things. And whether it's an Aristotelian persuasion approach that you're taking with pathos, ethos, and logos, and you know, figuring out ways in which you want to connect with them intellectually, um, on a personal level, or tap into the emotional aspects of what you're talking about with people, they're still people. They still are curious. They still want to sometimes hear what you have to say. Uh, sometimes they don't want to hear what you have to say, and you have to create it in a way that allows them to okay, I know you don't want it. This is a tough subject here, guys, but you're probably thinking, so you say the words for them. You're probably thinking, why am I in this course? Why am I listening to Neil Thompson's Teach the Geek right now? You're probably listening to it because there is a vulnerability there, um, but this show makes it more accessible. This show makes you feel like it's a safe space. Uh, and what I think is great about your credibility in this is you start off saying, hey, I wasn't born as this great teacher that you'll never be as good as me because I have this DNA. You're saying, you know what? I just wanted to be able to get an edge. I wanted to figure out how to do something that was getting in the way of other things I wanted to accomplish. And that's, I think, the first step, you know, acknowledging that there's a place to learn and then being open to connecting to those vulnerabilities and recognizing that. If you have something good to say, sometimes you can just share something natural, even around people that already know the subject, but sometimes just doing it on a personal level gives them a better understanding. And that's what's interesting. People think, well, I don't know enough because all these people know. Well, what they don't know is they don't know about you. They don't know how you approached it. And that's what I think the basis of your show is about. And I think that makes it inspirational to people that want to learn how to do public speaking. I would hope so. I mean... I created it for people like myself, people that come from the technical fields who have to give presentations or maybe just want to get better at speaking in front of other people, whether it be at a team meeting, you know, with their boss, even if someone asks them a question impromptu on, you know, at, at the water cooler, they don't get all frazzled about the, about giving the answer. It's just, I want to help people like myself because I see a lot of us, as I mentioned earlier, we have issues giving presentations in front of people yeah. a lot of times and we're using, <laughs> using a whole lot of technical jargon that non-technical people may not understand. We, we, we put a whole bunch of stuff on slides and read the slides and then 
and and wonder why people are falling asleep or looking at right. their phones. <laughs> like, oh, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because you're in that person's mind and then they just take what's in their mind and put it on there. And it's like, I get it. And, and that's an interesting thing that you bring up too, because it's just like with math and the math classes that I took, you know, there's some people that just get it in math. They're going to be the worst teachers because they're not going to be able to explain to you what they just get. It, it might even be impossible, you know? So sometimes like I always felt that, you know, it's interesting you mentioned this because part of the reason why I wanted to get into education, and I think I, I became proficient in um, STEM education was uh, in part because I had challenges just like everybody else does. And I think I created my own little cheat codes to be able to get through things. Um, and when I say cheat codes, meaning like tips and tricks that I use to be able to learn and teach myself how to learn, whether it's putting post-it notes up on a wall and mixing them around uh, to, you know, sitting under the tree with the physics book and reading it backwards, you know, as opposed to forwards and hoping I could collect with, uh, you know, connect some, some knowledge together. Like you got to find those things that work for you. And I think it's important for you to listen to a lot of speakers and say, can I do that? Or how would I do that? And then take stories that you know that you're comfortable with and begin to do that storytelling. I mean, people are like, oh, I don't do public, public speaking. I, I had someone just a couple of years ago, and now that you reminded me of this, well, the person was like, I don't want to talk in front of people and that sort of thing. And we were just having a conversation at like a picnic. This person was hilarious. She was telling jokes and coming up with all these ideas, but she is would never get out in front of people and tell them. And I was like, we should just put you, you know, behind a curtain, give you a microphone, and you could probably be a stand-up comedian. We don't have to tell you that there's, you know, a hundred people on the other side of that curtain, but she was hilarious. So I think some of it is up here. Some of it is the psychology of, do you feel like you should be speaking one? And then what are you trying to share? And then the other thing is, it's not one way. You can start off by just asking questions and getting people's response or taking a rhetorical approach and throw something out there that says, you know, have you ever wondered why your hair is curly? That was something I wondered. And you know what I found out? I found out that I wasn't really looking for why my hair was curly. I was really looking for how to ask better questions. I'm making this up. But it's that type of thing <laughs> that you walk away. And that's the moral to the story. Forget about the story for a second. The moral to the story is. And that's what I think people need to get into. And they realize that everybody has something to say, something to share, just has to be in the right environment, the right format, and maybe get up there with someone might be helpful too. You don't have to go it alone every time. Yeah. Well, this is really great, Dr. Greer. I, it's Yeah, you're absolutely right when it comes to the people and just them getting in their own head about giving presentations, just public speaking generally. And it's so unfortunate because there's so many people out there who, who avoid it but they have so much expertise that they, that the world could benefit from. But because of their own insecurities about speaking in front of people, we never get to hear it. And, and it just stays with them or maybe in their very small circle. And it's just, it's so, yeah, as I mentioned, it's so, it's so unfortunate that the rest of us don't get to share what this person knows. Oh, absolutely. And remember that, um, you reminded me of, remember that commercial that says, you know, this is drugs and this is your brain on drugs. And they cracked the egg and it started frying. Yeah. And then they said, any questions? Now, everybody remembers that commercial that was, you know, that came up during that period because it was all to try and tell you that your brain was being fried on drugs. That was the message. Uh, what was interesting about that, and please look that up if, if anyone that's listening to this that doesn't know that about that commercial, just go on YouTube and try to find that brain on drugs egg commercial. But what was interesting about it is they communicated so much information in such a short period of time because they created something that might be analogous to what they were trying to show. Richard Feynman, famous scientist, physicist, who was a uh, part of the Manhattan Project. I think he won a Nobel Prize. He created the famous Feynman diagrams in physics for particle interaction, a uh, subatomic particle interaction. He had a great way of thinking about things. He was kind of a um, an oddball as a physicist because he didn't really think about it in the typical classical ways. He was almost like hands-on with his theory. Uh, how can you be hands-on? Isn't that what experimentalists do? You know, like, but he was trying to be able to let people know that this was accessible, 
You know, so he would put his hands together and say, just imagine a bunch of things vibrating like this. Well, that's what's going on. And then you're like, oh, I get it. Nobody really started it in that way. And that's because understanding and sometimes the way we teach it, two different things. You know, we don't teach it from a human-centered approach. So a lot of technologists are doing more human-centered design, which is around empathy. If you take empathy in that design process, um, if it's an empathy-based or human-centered design process, you start there. You start by understanding, well, who am I talking to, first of all? Like you go up and give a speech. Some people give a speech, it doesn't matter who's in the room. They're going to say the same thing the same way regardless. Other people are like, well, how many people are in the audience? What are they here for? What are they expecting of me? What do you want me to talk about? That sort of thing. And then once they get that, they tune everything to what they think is going to work. And I'll tell you, Neil, I think those folks that are a little bit more um, flexible and able to take the input and the feedback loops that are necessary for any functioning system, um, it's important for them to put themselves in the position of the person sitting out there or that they're talking to in the room or they're sharing something with um, so that they can get it too. And, and, and it becomes a journey that we go on together, not just a one-way conversation. 100%. Empathy for the audience is, is something that should be in, in the forefront of most speakers, if not all speakers' minds. It's, you weren't always the expert that you were. Just put yourself in the position of the people that are in the audience. And what 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 can you impart to them that can at least have them understand at least a little bit about what you're talking about? I, I fully Absolutely. agree with you. <laughs> this has been a great conversation, Dr. Greer. Thank you for being a guest. How can people get in touch with you? Well, they can get in touch with me uh, by going to uh, where I work at the Michigan Science Center in Midtown Detroit at my-sci.org. That's my-sci.org or the Michigan Science Center. I serve as the president and CEO there. I've been in this role for about four years. This last four years have been pretty interesting <laughs> going through a pandemic and all sorts of things, but um, but it's been fun. Learn a lot about leadership and happy to talk to people about it. Or you can go on LinkedIn and find me at Christian Greer uh, uh, on LinkedIn at the Michigan Science Center. I'd be happy to connect. Excellent. Well, everyone, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. I work with technical professionals so they can present more effectively, especially in front of non-technical audiences. And you can learn more about that at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Dr. Greer. Thank you.